Hey. Good morning, everyone. Hey, how's it going? Good morning. Good, good, good. I'm teaching next, so I will cut out just a tiny bit early. I understand. Looking forward to it. You get to judge all the all the things that I say wrong in this class since hey, you're you're the man now. <laughs> For a few more months. I have your slideshow pulled up uh, in case I start screwing up bad enough, so I can start just rip, just. Just going through what you teach. <laughs> I figured there'd be some overlap in what you were intending to do. Um, I have a little bit of a different direction that I'm going in. Uh, so, you know, your your stuff was seen was more about, um, you know, kind of uh, giving an overview of like different things you can like study and uh, and like how to study them, the resources for it. And, Really, what I'm trying to do here is uh, is to um, kind of uh, give an overview of what it is as uh, how it's different than other things. How it's and um, we'll we'll talk about it in a second. Okay, I'm making sure I'm set up. Kind of, sorta. Okay. You know anything nice with your uh, SO for uh, Valentine's Day? <laughs> it's all good. We're stuck at home, staying healthy. We'll be spending the day cuddled, cuddled up on the couch as I have a medical procedure on Monday, so we're not leaving or going anywhere. I'm not going over here. Well, good luck. I had a back injection on a uh, cortisone injection on uh, on Thursday, so it actually went surprisingly well. All right, so it's ten o'clock right now. I have eight attendees listed for the uh, for the class itself. I'll give it just two more minutes and then we'll jump right on in. Well, while you're doing that, I'm going to get a refill on coffee. <laughs> All right, Lucy's back, so we can uh, jump right into this. All right, so, hey, everybody, I'm Julian, and let's share my screen so that you can see what I'm looking at. Cool. 
cool. All right. So historical martial arts, arts and sciences. What is it and how can I do it? So you can see my little details down there. I'm Master Julian. Hey, everybody. And uh, so um, I am also the Deputy Kingdom Minister of Arts and Sciences or Deputy KMOAS for Historical Martial Arts. Uh, Cataldo is my deputy. And really, I'm kind of teaching this class in that capacity, uh, both as that and as a practitioner. And, uh, and really, my goal for what we're going to talk about today is establishing really what historical martial arts is and really getting to the basics of, uh, hey, how, what is this kind of unicorn uh, pursuit that, in my opinion, most people in the SCA don't clearly understand, um, at least the boundaries of it. And uh, even those who are laurels in it a lot of the time. So I'm trying to uh, clearly define some of the stuff that, that's related to it. So we'll just jump right on into it. Uh, all right, here we go. So the official definition, uh, this was approved by the board directors in uh, July 2005, and it is the non-competitive study and demonstration of historical martial arts systems and principles. So where am I getting that from? I'm going to show where I am. So you can see right here, this is the actual beginning charter, and there's a familiar name there at the top right here. That's Master Aaron. So uh, him and uh, Tim Jennings worked with the board directors in 2005 to create this document that is kind of the founding document of historical martial arts, arts and sciences. And it kind of defines a lot of what we're, a lot of what's, what, uh, you know, what it is, what it isn't. And uh, I'll refer back to this, but I'm going to try and mostly rely on my slideshow to, uh, to teach what's going on. So, but I'll make that available toward the end uh, so y'all can have it as well. So it's the non-competitive study and demonstration of historical martial arts systems and principles. What does that mean? Right here. So it's when you're, and when I say what this means, it's when you're doing this versus when you're doing other things. So it's when what you're doing is supported by research and documentation consistent with the standards expected by other ANS disciplines. So when you're doing historical martial arts, historical combat that is supported by research and documentation and to the same level as what one would you know, expect and what you probably see with uh, your, ANS, your ANS friends who are also being held to a standard of that. One of the big differentiating factors between this and martial pursuits, and when I say martial pursuits, I mean armored fighting, uh, rapier, the things that fall under rapier, that sort of stuff. So in presenting, demonstrating, and teaching historical combat arts, neither the teachers, students, or any participants shall engage in free assault, sparring, or any form of competitive use of the arts or practice weapons. Uh, drills and exercises are okay, competitive sparring is not. So that's kind of, so this is just what I'm doing here is I'm just establishing what when you're doing historical martial arts, arts and sciences versus when you're not. So you can see there at the bottom, these are kind of two buckets that I can put these in. So what is, you know, is HMA and so studying manuals and historical documentation, uh, translating, it, interpreting, teaching, uh, learning and drilling those techniques in a non-competitive manner. So that means that you're not going for points. These are all controlled drills that are based on that are based on the manual or based on artwork. It doesn't need to be just the manuals or you know your original research. Um, and then theatrical performance of it is also covered in it. it. It's not historical martial arts, arts and sciences if it involves free play and sparring. And if you're using those techniques while in competition, now that you could be taking the stuff you learn in HMA and S and then applying it to competition. But um, I think it's important to understand that uh, if we are being serious about historical martial arts, arts and sciences as being something different, distinct uh, from, from the fighting, from rapier and armored fighting, we need to kind of clearly say, put them in buckets. Any questions so far? Okay, 
So now I'm going to do my kind of sales pitch. So why should you do uh, historical martial arts and sciences? So first thing is that it's fun uh, to learn how people really used to fight. That's really at the essence of what historical martial arts, arts and sciences is, is learning how people used to fight. It's not it's not, you know, conjecture. It's not creating a new thing. Um, you're using that reliable research that's to the same standard of other arts and sciences, and uh, you're doing it for recreating historical combat. So there's no danger of sparring. So the danger of injuries is low. You know, people, there's, let's be honest, a lot of people don't do fighting in the SCA because they don't want to get beat up and they don't want to get, uh, they don't want to get, uh, you know, pushed around. Uh, they don't like the idea of the, of the competitive aspect of it. So great thing for HMA ANS, you don't have to do that. It ends the, you know, the end of that bucket is, is uh, spar is drilling. So all body types and ability levels are welcome and uh, disabilities or low athleticism are less of a bar to progress than competitive than the competitive martial pursuit. So, you know, if you don't have um, maybe you have an injury, maybe you have uh, maybe you're just not in great shape, maybe for any number of reasons, you don't feel like you all would be great for the spot for a competitive sparring, then you can you can do this. And it's a much, much lower threat level, I would say. And uh and really, anyone can do it. You can go to an ANS practice, and literally everybody at that a at that arts and sciences uh, practice can do this. Uh, could do historical martial arts, arts and sciences. Lastly, it's inexpensive. So the the bar to do historical martial arts, arts and sciences is very low, in my opinion. So because we're not doing um, competitive, we're not doing competitive sparring. The requirements for safety gear is lower you know you don't you don't you don't have to necessarily as long as it's being done how about this safely uh you really don't need a lot of safety equipment it's really to the comfort of the user so like i say here you can just have a couple sticks uh, a friend and you don't even really need a friend because you can do it on your own and uh internet access and i say internet access because you don't really need to purchase books you have the wicked hour website which i'll show and uh and there's just a ridiculous amount of, uh, of, of historical manuals and historical research that you can find. So sticks, a friend optional and internet access, and you're golden for a long time if you're just, if you're just there to study historical martial, martial arts, arts and sciences. So really low bar, you don't, have, you don't have to spend almost any money in order to do it. Now, what I'm going to show here is, you know, what what does an HMA ANS practice look like? How is that different than going to a rapier practice or an armor practice or a fighting practice or or any, any number of things? So I'm giving some examples here. So one could be historical techniques taught by instructor, kind of what people, if you are familiar with the HEMA community or just a regular martial arts community, uh, a martial arts practice that you would see in HEMA or uh, or Asian martial arts is is uh would be an hma ans practice in the sca um so group or individual study and discussion of the historical manual and manuals so really just kind of like a group study imagine uh you know just people people getting together and you have your you have a, a subject that you're studying together historical martial arts arts and sciences learning the language of martial techniques and historical and historical language so this is kind of an awkwardly phrased way that I put this, but um, I, I did a historical martial arts, arts and sciences practice in the Outlands. And my objective for that practice was for me and my friends to learn the language of Bolognese, of Bolognese uh, uh, combat, of the Bolognese tradition. So learning all the like, imbricatas, learning, learning um, you know, all the, different, all the different verbiage, all the different terms, because there's a lot of them. And uh, and practicing them, so that was that was a an historical martial arts arts and science practice was learning that sort of stuff, um, practicing solo techniques, drills with partners, historical and historical research and presentation on topics um, other than the techniques themselves. And what I mean by that is uh, doing like a presentation on like the life and times of this of this uh, historical uh, fencing master 
or this or this person, you know, and uh, this is a presentation about how, you know, how swords were designed at that time. Um, and really things that are adjacent adjacent to just the techniques side, because it's not just the techniques, it's the culture and, and that sort of stuff. So, and there's all sorts of different ways that, that you can do it, but really the key thing is we're going back to that idea that it's historical, historically researched and, and supported, and then it's also not, um, it's also not competitive. So one of the big things that I've found as an obstacle for people pursuing historical martial arts, arts and sciences is, uh, is building a portfolio. And what I mean by that is communicating what you do to the other people in the arts and sciences community, because people in the arts and sciences communities largely understand things through the, through what they want to understand things through a portfolio. So there's, so we'll start out. These are my suggestions, by the way, it's, not comprehensive. So what kind of format could you build a portfolio in? You can have a, a physical portfolio that you take around with you, that's fine. But um, in today's digital uh, day and age, it's hard to share that sort of thing. And if you're not there in person with them, you can't share it. So format, you can have a personal web page. So uh, Master Lloyd has a, uh, or, Baron, or Baron Lloyd has his personal web page and it's great. Um, and if you want to, if you, you can use that, where if you're skilled at that, go for it. Um, I'm a big fan of the wiki, um, the historic, the, uh, um, the kingdom wikis. If, you know, it doesn't take that much to learn how to do it, how to do it right. And you can build your wiki and build your links on there and uh, plug in image files. Um, I'm not sure how embedding video works right now. I think it might be tricky, um, but you can link video like to if you have like a youtube channel and then finally another option is a shareable cloud storage where you have like a, a google drive that you can that you can share your links to your google drive and say here here's all my stuff on my google drive that i use for my portfolio so those are those are three suggested formats that i have for uh for for the portfolio as far as what can be in it these are different media so um I suggest video, video and materials of classes taught. So what I mean by materials is like your slide deck. Have that video. Maybe you have it on a YouTube in a YouTube link. Maybe you have a record, actual recording of it that's uh, that's on your cloud storage. Your video of historical martial arts techniques. And um, one really good example of this is uh, Guy Windsor's uh, web page. Guy Windsor, actually, he has a wiki, I should say. He has, a, he has his own wiki where he links all of his, uh, where he embeds his video uh, performing different plays. And he basically has different manuals where he, where he lays out his plays and has, uh, has um, how I put it, um, embedded video of him doing those different things. So that's a really kind of whiz bang way to do it. I highly recommend you look at, uh, Guy Windsor's, um, I think he has it as a wiki. So Guy Windsor wiki, you can Google that. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a really good example if you wanna show, show you doing cool stuff. Um, video and written presentations on, him, on HMA topics. So that's a pretty broad umbrella, but, uh, but things like classes, uh, a lecture that you've given about it, Kind of falls under under the uh, under the first one as well, but um, it doesn't necessarily need to be a recording of a class. It can just be you talking. Actually, one really good example of that is a uh, is um, uh, Remy's uh, Remy's stuff on uh, on his uh, on his YouTube channel. The uh, let's see, I can I can tell I I can find that later. But uh, but if y'all are familiar with Remy uh, Remy Lamontagne's uh, YouTube channel from the East. He, uh, he talks about these and, uh, typically it's, it's a standalone presentation and they're really, really good by the way. You should take a look at them. Uh, all right. Original research pretty much stands, that's, that can fit a lot of different things, but really you, you doing your own stuff, uh, your own, your own research, uh, for, for, um, for historical martial arts topics, published, unpublished, throw it on there. Interpretations of HMA documents and translations of HMA documents. And I draw the line between the two where translations are just, as we're, as we're saying, it's, it's a translation of it. Um, 
a lot of translations include interpretive uh, portions, but it can just be, hey, I'm just doing the basic translation of this uh, of this from Italian, from old Italian to to modern English, and uh, the interpretations of those uh, of those documents, which is actually like running with it and uh, and distilling it into modern language. Um, I would say that uh, a good example of a of an interpretation is right here. So like um, Devin Borman's book. So introduction to the Italian rapier, it's, it blends a lot of different approaches, but he's, uh, he's interpreting it and kind of turning into his own understanding of the system. Any questions so far? We're really breezing through this, so we probably won't go the full hour on this. Okay, now we're gonna get into the critical portion of the class. And uh, I'm gonna kind of give an idea of what the HMA ANS community looks like right now. And, uh, and kind of um, maybe a little bit of criticism of it and where I'd like to see it go. So what's the current state of historical martial arts, arts and sciences in the SCA as a whole in the society? So uh, there are typically two or more historical martial arts, uh, arts and sciences laurels in, uh, in each kingdom. And, there are more in some and there are less in others. Uh, the middle has a lot. Um, I think the, I think Kite has, 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 uh, has, uh, has more than that. Um, here in the, in Atlantia, we have, um, we have Dante, we have um, Aaron. I believe Aaron has some stuff that, we, that he, that he was recognized as a laurel for, uh, or elevated as a laurel for, um, some other stuff as well, some of his other uh, arts and sciences participation, but very much in keeping with historical martial arts. And then I believe Roz is as well, Rosalind Delmer. So uh, that's kind of, there's two or more typically per kingdom. I am working on creating a list, a comprehensive list of all the laurels in the SCA uh, for, for historical martial arts, arts and sciences. So most kingdoms have a recognized historical martial arts ANS uh, deputy minister. Uh, that actually was laid out in the original in the uh, founding document, where it said the kingdoms of the of the SCA may choose to appoint a knowledgeable deputy to coordinate and oversee the activity on the kingdom level. And that's me right now. It was Lloyd before me. Uh, Lloyd, do you know who it was before you? Uh, it's been several people. I know um, Dante has done it, and Wistrick has done it. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, I'm not sure who else. I, I'm missing at least two, I think. That's okay. Uh, but anyway, so we do have one here in Atlantia, which is good. And I, ha and I have a deputy to my deputy position. Uh, so it is mostly practiced by the rapier community. And this is kind of one of, one of, the, uh, one of, the, thing, one of the parts that I would consider to be a critical aspect where um, I think the perception of uh, historical martial arts, arts and sciences, that it's kind of a sideshow to the, to the rapier show. And, um, but I think the large, it's largely a true perception that, um, that HMA and S are, is large, is mostly done by people in the rapier community and the cut and thrust community. Um, so it's, uh, poorly understood, not only from the outside, but also the inside. So, um, let's delve into that for a second. Uh, when we're talking about from the outside, um, part of that we can look like the ANS. You know, the ANS community. It's hard for them to most of the time to understand. Hey, this is this they are doing in arts and science. How do I how do I see what they're doing? What are they creating? And uh, how do I know when they're doing HMA ANS versus when they're doing rapier and cut and thrust? Um, and then from the inside. Uh, I'll give a really a good example of that is when I ask people who are um, typically uh, GOAs and laurels for historical martial arts, arts and sciences. If you ask ten of them, you know what? Uh, how do you? How you know what are the? What are the standards for these different awards? And how do you get there? Um, you'll get ten different answers. It's it's really non-standardized as far as the understanding of that pursuit, even by the people who are laurels in it. So the uh, last thing is the community struggles to recognize HMA ANS achievements due to 
understood divisions between minor practitioners doing the martial pursuit versus historical martial arts saying that. So I've already kind of kind of talked about that a little bit. You know, when you see someone who's doing rape here, you know, when are they doing HMA and S? You know, what what where do I, you know do I put this thing on award recommendations for rape here and this thing on award recommendations for uh for um for arts and sciences, you know, do I just do one until they've got until they've topped out on, on one and then go to the other? It's hard to understand. All right. And this might be a little bit of a controversial slide because it is it's based on stereotype. But uh, that being said, um, from my pretty exhaustive looking uh, talking to everybody that I know throughout the society. Um, this is really what I consider a typical HMA laurel. So first was a white scarf uh, or kingdom equivalent rapier grant of arms winner uh, uh, recognized prior to the creation of the order of defense. So we saw at the beginning that the charter, the charter, this was HMA ANS was defined and made bona fide in 2005. And the order of defense was created in 2015. So really there's a 10 year gap. There's a 10 year period there where, uh, where some, where really people who were uh, doing rapier in a lot of ways were um, kind of, this was their way of becoming a peer was, uh, was at least through that pursuit. So um, I would say the, yeah, definitely the majority of um, historical martial arts laurels, even to this day, uh, were a white scarf prior to uh, prior to the creation of the order of defense. All right, next one: studies Italian rapier primarily, primarily at the time of elevation, and then uh, usually, at least at this time, has a journeyman or higher level understanding of other manuals and historical martial arts disciplines. So, what I mean by that is that um, is that you know Italian rapier was one probably the most um, there's the most documentation on it uh, for rapier study and uh, compared to other rapier rapier manuals or rapier traditions, I should say. And then uh, most of those people also have, you know, dipped their toes in other things like, you know, like um, Fiore, like maybe Bolognese school, maybe German, maybe the German stuff, maybe Destreza. So, uh, but generally by and large, I would say that um, that if there was the largest bucket by far of um, of kind of the the field of expertise for the current the current uh, group of HMA laurels is Italian rapier, and then uh, has been elevated to the order of defense since that time and devotes comparatively more time and energy to the activities under that peerage, being the fencing peerage, uh, than the order of the laurel. So the that's uh, you know that's. That might seem kind of like a, a damning statement, uh, but um, like I said it's a controversial slide. But I think it's but I think it's largely true. Um, there's more there is more to do uh, right now in the rapier in the rapier community, um, and there are more people doing rapier than there are uh, historical martial arts, arts and sciences. So it, it's it's an easier thing to do um, if you're if you're both a uh, an HMA Laurel and a uh, and a um, Master of Defense to really devote more time to being a Master of Defense. So this is like I said, this is really kind of the picture that I have, uh, at least in my mind, from what I've seen of a typical historical martial arts Laurel. Um, there are lots of exceptions to this, but uh, but I'm interested um, in other people's thoughts about this. Uh, any anybody have any thoughts or input? Um, my first thought um, is, at, like, as somebody who does arts and sciences that are that are not rapier, as well as some HMA ANS, is is do you see that there's a place for uh, HMA ANS in um, arts and sciences competitions that don't specify a particular uh, kind of object, right? Like, I'm thinking things like the Tempore Atlantia. Um, or, or other kinds of arts and sciences competitions where you're going to see uh, garb and um, pottery and uh, you know that kind of thing. Like, how do you how do you present a piece of HMA ANS in the context of uh, a competition that normally has physical artifacts? That's a really good question, um, and I don't. I'm not sure if I have a really good an if I have a really good answer for it. Um, I would say that. Uh, there's really kind of two ways that you can that you can approach that. Um, one is to 
fit within the boundaries of what they're saying of what they're of what they're um of what the object is and then make it as hma adjacent as possible so if you're creating a piece of garb like maybe maybe having a um a uh, a reproduction of the um padded the padded uh, fencing jerkin in the mat uh as you know this is this is this is what people this is my recreation of a of of the uh, fencing protection that people had in that time period. Um, uh, the, or just like, or, you know, making a sword or making, making things, like I said, things that are adjacent to it. Uh, but, um, the other way is to kind of try to shoehorn what you do, uh, into, into it. Uh, so maybe doing, I guess, having like a video or a lecture on, uh, on that sort of thing that you have on that. So, or original research. Search. Ultimately, I would I would lump um, HMA ANS into um, research ANS. Uh, it's you know because I think there are broad categories of of, uh, of ANS and and ultimately um, I would say that it's it's a research it's it's a research one and you know because really at the end of the day that's the big difference between uh, between um, between HMA and uh, fencing and like armored combat is the research aspect and grounding it in uh in in the history of it so so uh it my suggestion for for the scenario that you described would be the first one would be creating things that are adjacent to it and ultimately it's it's probably hard to become a uh to you know top out on the hma ans track while staying 100 percent pure to just doing the the activities that i've been describing um you know being I, I think that it's probably a good step forward to show yourself as well-rounded in the ans community by doing by doing um things like i guess leather work and uh and up oh, lucy you're ready, you're raising your hand yeah checking the comments uh baron lloyd just shared oh. a uh his ans display from that K picture South. come through? Yeah, it came through. Looks okay. good. So I, I've had a display at, at King of Arts and Sciences where I, um, you know, had a laptop showing our videos and had my source material out and I had a notebook of all my handouts and the flashcards and all the other materials that I'd made and, you know, those kinds of things just to show just the HMA stuff. Uh, we've done demos at King of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Dante at least once has run an all-day class during Kingdom Arts and Sciences when there was space for that. Um, and the other comment I had while I was here was um, not only did um, a bunch of white scarves get laurels because that was their path to a peerage because there wasn't a rapier one, there were an awful lot of us that got pelicans for doing rapier service. Um, I didn't know that. Before that existed. So, you know, Alan and Adon and me and um, I could list another half dozen at least um, that that was the path we took when the mod didn't exist. Yeah, but yeah, no, uh, Lloyd's done got just a shit ton of uh, of of participating in the uh, in the a in the a and s world um, by by doing by being in those those sort of competitions. So so uh, and yeah. and the other thing I do is uh, you know I try to walk around and take pictures of everybody's. Uh, presentations uh, so that, you know, it shows that I'm participating in the ANS community as a judge, as a pearl, as a, you know, somebody that's interested in what other people are doing. I'm playing with them. I'm not just this rapier guy that, you know, you know, claims to be doing ANS. Yeah. Antonio, you have your hand raised. Indeed I do. And um, just as a quick, um, question on this. I know that the typical HMA Laurel has been particularly focused on the rapier and the cotton thrust side of things, but have we ever seen any examples that were tied more towards any of the other combat pursuits such as the archery world or the equestrian world or the siege engine world? Because I know that at least before the order of the Laurel was, or at least the order of defense was established, or before that point, they were, the rapier community was in the same boat where the only path to a Peerage would either be through service to those communities or through the academic study of them. Did any of the other disciplines really achieve a peerage through the ANS side of their stuff? So I don't 
I don't know any off off the hand, at least where that where that was the vast majority of it. I do know that um, what's it? I think that uh, um, Scott Wilson slash uh, I I forget what his um, what his uh, SCA persona name is, um, but he he runs a uh, Darkwood Armory. I know that he's big into jousting, and uh, I'm not sure if his uh, if his research on uh, on equestrian and jousting had anything to do with. Uh, and I'm almost positive he's a laurel um we, we've think, got a couple of archery laurels in the in the kingdom okay so so yes uh, i don't, i don't know anybody who has done who has um done it through like the armored the armored background where they do uh where but it's entirely possible where like you're that person is studying uh the kind of um pa uh, passage of arms uh tradition where you could so they are recreating those passages of arms from and uh, an armored combat. Um, that is that is also definitely a uh, a I, I would call it a fertile um, opportunity for people in the uh, in the armored with an armored background to uh, to pursue that. Uh, Lucian, did you you posted a link? You're muted. Yeah, uh, sorry, I went to the wrong space to unmute. I just posted a link. There is a group on YouTube, uh, Academia, uh, something or another, but it's, that's the link. And the specific link I shared is they are following a specific, uh, from a manual. And as they do the maneuvers and everything, the screen will actually flash to the manual. Oh, okay, yeah. And it just, it's quick flash. There's a couple others that do it, but that's the only one I can think of off the top of my head. But it's obvious that they are doing a demo and not free sparring because, well, I would not move at those speeds without the protective gear, and they're not wearing protective gear, so. Um, and I think that, that that's actually a really good, um, that's a really good uh, um, way to, include go loop lump uh, uh circle back around to theatrical performance as being as being a uh, another way to do this because you see that less often um but uh but having like making like really cool videos of uh that tell a story um that that also demonstrate these uh those techniques is uh is a great way to do it too and it's something that everyone loves to see and is easy to uh to to understand um by people outside of uh, outside of um, outside of the normal, I guess in in the in the arts and sciences community, uh, there's another group. There's an Italian. Uh, there's an Italian group that does that does that as well. So uh, there, that's I would say that's another very fertile place that you can that you can uh, use another fertile way that you can pursue uh, historical martial arts, arts and sciences. Uh, Antonio, did you raise your hand again, or is it just still raised? Um, I did raise it again because another kind of question popped up when we were talking about theatrical performance. Would the concept of studying the, like the concept of theatrical combat itself, as, as opposed to using theatrical combat as a medium to express what we're studying here throughout the manual, so like essentially stage combat, would studying like the historical stage combat practices fall within? Um, HMA ANS, or would that be something more on like the Bardic and on the Bardic and like theatrical side of the ANS spectrum? I would say it absolutely would, um, and that's that that definitely is talked about in the um, in the uh, founding documents. So I'll actually just uh, I'll bring that passage up into the uh, shared shared screen. So let's zoom in on that part. So you see right here. So theatrical performances. So all theatrical performances involving stage combat will choreograph, rehearse, and perform such stage combats in a manner consistent with the safety guidelines set forth by professional organizations. The include, these include plays and performances, uh, the primary purpose of which is the entertainment of the audience. So no free combat play will take place within any theatrical performance conducted as part of the activities of the SCA Incorporated. So the uh, entertainment pieces is, is definitely is is uh is totally free game is totally is totally a fair play i should say um with with this uh there's one thing that's really cool that i've seen done uh before is people attempting to choreograph 
uh, the the fights in um, in historical plays. So like in in, uh, in Shakespeare, uh, you know, chore choreographing um, the things that were the uh, the fight scenes in Shakespeare. That's yeah, that's awesome. That's total. That's totally cool. And you should and do, and especially doing it through a historical combat lens, like that would be an awesome way to uh, to show to uh to pursue historical martial arts uh arts and sciences and to and to communicate to the to the rest of the community so yeah totally that's a great idea all right so i'm going to move on to the next slide i think i have one left before we get into just outright discussion so these are some challenges that i see in the community and some of what i consider to be proposed solutions to it so uh, the first challenge is, as we've talked about so far, is the perception of historical martial arts, arts and sciences being a rapier sideshow. Um, the, my proposed solution to that is, engage, is engagement and recruitment of non-rapier members of the populace into the pursuit of historical martial arts, arts and sciences, because um, it's, it's not necessarily a hard obstacle that, I mean, it can remain a rapier sideshow, where everyone, where most everybody who does it is in the rapier community, you know, it's it's still going to exist. Uh, is it going to grow? Mm, probably not that much. Um, and my, I think that it's it would it's important for uh, for the HMA ANS community to um, have outreach to people who normally wouldn't necessarily who aren't in the rapier community and say, hey, you should be uh, you you know you can uh, you can be doing this too. So people who are theater people, like uh, like what Antonio's uh, kind of um, your your solution is really interesting, in my opinion, for theater people, for film people, uh, for um, for people who are just at an arts and sciences gathering and maybe are bored with what they're doing right then. You have and you have uh, you have some you know some practice sorts and say, hey, you wanna you want to. Um, uh, want me to teach you how a uh, cool technique that was done at that time we're not gonna we're not gonna be actually fighting for it you know i just want to show you some cool stuff that's uh in my opinion that that outreach is important and is often kind of um uh neglected uh low participation levels it's related to that uh but um i think that the generally uh hma ans is probably one of the least um practices practiced disciplines of, uh, of arts and sciences in the arts and sciences community. Um, and I think that generally we should, uh, um, having dedicated HMA ANS practices and uh, the inclusion of historical martial arts, arts and sciences at, um, at generic, at like overarching uh, ANS practices and gatherings is a good way to do that. Where we, like I said, engage those, uh, engage people that wouldn't necessarily um, be, be, uh, uh, be doing it through the rapier world. Okay, uh, lack of mentorship. And this, this kind of um, goes to what I described earlier with the problems of like the typical HMA, uh, HMA Laurel is that they're, they're meant, the vast majority of their apprentices are through the rapier, or through their fighting, their fighting, uh, um, their fighting disciplines. Um, so right now, uh, I know, I think I know only one or two uh, HMA laurels that uh, that have um, apprentices who are really only there for the H for the HMA ANS side and are not doing and are not their apprentice uh, for for like the rape for the rapier world or for the fighting world. I might be wrong about that, but um, but it's 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 rare, and uh, I think that um, that that's once you're at that level, it's it's important to um, to really try to have ANS apprentices, and uh, so I think that and having that mentorship um, is really very important in the ANS world, especially where prowess and just winning tournaments uh, isn't is isn't enough to uh, to to progress. So integration into the uh, kingdom arts and sciences communities. So right now I would say that it's part, another problem is that, uh, is that um, with ANS being, with historical martial arts ANS being a seen as fighting and not ANS in a lot of ways, um, it's not really very well integrated into the ANS, into the kingdom ANS communities. 
uh, and not just in Atlantia. You know, I would say in Atlantia, it's probably better integrated than a lot of other kingdoms. But um, in my opinion, the way ahead for this is that, uh, and this is going to be, this is hard. This is probably the hardest sell I have with the whole group. The whole thing here is uh, historical martial arts, ANS practitioners going to events where there are tournaments uh, for their for their for the martial stuff that they do, and not fighting in that tournament. Instead, being like, you know what, I'm gonna be, I'm here as an ANS person, and I'm here to, and I'm here gonna be hanging out with the ANS people, and I'm gonna be doing historical martial arts ANS instead of fighting in these tournaments, uh, or or supporting those tournaments. You know, that's that's a hard thing to do, especially if you're if you're if you're not like if you're not a peer on that uh, from that fighting from that fighting side. And, uh, but, but I think that that would, that would go a long way toward acceptance into the, uh, into the ANS community. Uh, let's see. There's... Yeah. Let's see. Can us something? Yeah. Um, so, uh, Creations of portfolios and research that is clearly understood by the other uh, ANS practitioners. I think we, we've already talked a lot about, a little bit about this. Um, I think that uh, that one of the big obstacles toward people being recognized in historical martial martial arts ANS is that people see them doing rapier, they see them doing cut and thrust, and, and they see them doing historical martial arts ANS stuff. And instead of saying they're doing HMA ANS, they say they're doing they're doing their martial their martial their martial pursuit and if they see them doing something awesome for that they'll recognize them for that martial pursuit not for the ans side and uh i think one of the big ways to 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 go over that also is creation of these portfolio of portfolios that say i am doing ans i have a arts i have a research and art portfolio and science portfolio that the other members of the community can see that shows just like they do all right. Yeah. So universities. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, and I'm not glossing over the, the chat. We can talk about the different the individual thoughts on this in a second, but uh, we'll go over this last thing. So low comparative award uh, recognition for uh, HMA and S. I said comparative because people do get recognized, but it's relatively low compared to the other uh, the other ANS um, pursuits. And I think that the way ahead for that is one: people who are who have who are established on that path, um, going out of their way to promote and uh, and and help people who are on that path be recognized by the ANS community. I am not a member of a uh, of an ANS polling order, so I don't know how those conversations happen behind the scenes. I have I have been told stuff about it, but like I said, I am. I am not necessarily the most, uh, I don't have as much firsthand experience in this recommendation. And uh, last but not least, uh, clarified and generally understood expectations for ANS awards for HMA ANS. And I talked about this earlier, where um, you ask 10 HMA laurels how what the standards are for uh, for the different levels of HMA ANS recognition, you know, AOA, GOA, um, uh, peerage, you get 10 different answers. And I think that that's a that's kind of a, that's a big problem. Um, it's it's you know we think that's a problem in the fencing community. It's way worse for uh, HMA ANS. You know, you, it's uh, I've heard things as diverse as um, as simple as saying uh, AOA is reading the manual, uh, GOA is um, teaching the manual, and peerage is being able to write the manual. Um, that's simple it's not agreed upon across the across the community um uh one is like the number of manuals the number of the amount of research that you have um and then the depth of research that you have uh and then there's also aspects of you know participation you know showing if it's your first peerage uh I, I, uh yeah it's you get so many different answers and i think that really there needs to be clarified and generally understood um at least more understood uh, standards and expectations for HMA and S awards. So that is my last content slide. And now to open up, uh, we have another 50, like 14 minutes left 
of this. So if we have uh, any thoughts or further discussion, um, I'm going to prioritize Lloyd because I know Lloyd needs to step out in just a second. Lloyd, do you have any uh, any thoughts or or um, kind of anything to add for what we've talked about so far? Uh, I think you did a good job of, um, of breaking things down and uh, attacking this this topic from a, a different direction than than uh, than I did the last time I, I gave this type of presentation where I was trying to kind of make the case to the non HMA people that we, we are a valid um, ANS topic and that we're doing um, research and, and um, um, do, you know, pursuing documentation and, and doing all of the things in the same rigorous way that they are. Um, and so this was a different attack on that. And I think, I think it was good to, to try to focus those. It, it's easier to, to get the people who already have interest in the topic to, to uh, understand what's going on and expand our horizons than it is to expand the horizons of people who are less interested in the topic. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's, there's, there's so much potential in this, but it's, it's, um, it's hard. It's hard. Um, like it's the, the weird, the biggest paradox that I find um, is that this is the uh, historical martial arts laurels have been a thing uh, and the recognition of it has been a thing for, um, for over 15 years now. And it's still really very tiny and very misunderstood. Um, I'm not sure if the creation of the order of defense, maybe a, a, a byproduct of the creation of order of defense is that it, it, um, it, uh, uh, kind of distracted from it a little bit, which is probably a bad term because it's the, I, I love the order of defense, but, uh, it's, but it's, it really, it's still very misunderstood 15, 15 years later. It's still very niche and it's still, uh, it's, um, it has a lot of problems. Well, I, yeah, and I think you're, you're correct. They're kind of two, two things, two ways that it distracted one, the new mods and I'm one of them, um, are focusing on that less than their ANS, which is not really my case, but I, I can see that in, in some other, other cases. Um, but also from the ANS community, they they now go. There, there's no pressure for us to make HMA laurels anymore because they can get a master of defense, um, and therefore they're less focused on understanding the ANS contributions of the of the community and and recognizing that. So, and I'm and I'm somewhat guilty of that I I know I've written a dozen or twenty. Um, 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 recommendations for coral branches for people that are doing good work. Um, but I've done a lot fewer pearls and laurels recommendations. And yeah. um, I think perhaps there is, there are people that, that need that recommendation. Uh, Antonio, you raised your hand. I did. And I'm um, kind of piggybacking off a question that I asked earlier in regards to the other martial disciplines besides the rapier community. In the event that we actually get a, an additional period level order that covers either equestrian archery or just like an omnibus one that just like encapsulates the rest of the martial pursuits that currently don't have a prowess based path to peerage, do you think that that would either further enhance? the visibility of historical martial arts or in the ANS space, or would that further make it difficult to be recognized specifically for um, HMA in the ANS space because now every path that's on the martial side or more of those paths, depending on how it plays out, would theoretically have a path to get prepared based on prowess as opposed to the research side? So that's a, that's a, uh... Very good question. Um, I would say that when when you're talking about archery and uh, and equestrian, I don't think that there's that they represent a large enough uh, portion of the HMA ANS community that they that um, it that the creation of a peerage for those would affect uh, would significantly affect the uh, the 
the the volume the the recognition of people on the HMA ANS track. It's um, there are some really good. There's there's a ton of archery manuals out there. There's a ton of uh, historical archery manuals. There's a ton of historical equestrian manuals out there, um, and uh, I think that they probably have the same uh, speculate, speculation, speculating, uh, they probably have the same sort of, a uh, sort of thing where, um, where the research that they do into the historical side of it is more often recognized, uh, within that, within their framework, um, rather than, uh, rather than, um, through the, uh, rather than, um, uh, through HMA and S, although when we're talking about peerage, then, um, then probably peerage is where, uh, is where they are, but is where they get. But when people, I think when people get recognized for a peerage for uh, ANS, um, it's for those things. It's probably not, the perception is probably not that it's ANS, that's HMA that they're doing it. It's like they, they'd be called like an equestrian laurel or an archery laurel or that sort of stuff. So um, I, don't know, I feel like maybe I'm kind of dancing around what you're, uh, what you're asking, but, um, but, I, I guess the, the main the main response I don't think it will it would significantly change um, HM, HMA ANS as it's currently understood. Uh, but but I will say one thing: um, there are I think very clear ways that you can that you can become a uh, a an HMA laurel. And I'd say the easiest way, and by easiest I mean kind of just saying you need to make me an a, an HMA ANS laurel is uh is publishing is published is having a published uh published work that the that uh that um you know that's that's dante has a has has published has published books and published translations um my my um my my maestro growing up in the rapier community was a was not a mod but but was a hma and s uh laurel and he he got it largely by publishing um so so i'd say if you want to be an HMA Laurel and you want to like really objectively get there, publishing, you know, the um, having that publish it, publishing a translation or interpretation, and uh, in addition to the other steps along that path for teaching, is probably the objectively the most objective way that you can get recognized. Um. I know Baron Lloyd is, if you saw in the chat, I'd ask him. I thought he was, but couldn't really remember. Um, but I am also a member of the Order of the Pearl. Okay. Um, do you have it? Do you have any thoughts on like, on how, on uh, like polling discussions for people on HMA ANS in the, uh, wait, Pearl is, yeah, Pearl's a, uh, is the GOA, right? right? Yeah, GOA. So do you have any thoughts on insights on, on how those discussions work for HMA and as people um, when people are being uh, polled for the order of the pearl? Primarily, it is very similar. Well, I really can't talk about other orders. Uh, I mean, the only other order, I, I'm in a couple of orders, okay, but I'd say the like GOA it. and the Pelican, but the... Um, when it comes up for discussion, there is, hang on. Sorry. Uh, when it's discussed, a most of the discussion falls into what and how the recreation, it doesn't matter the art or science um, that is in that is being for the person that is being spoken of. I'm having to do this in very broad terms. Yes, uh, okay. But what I would recommend is that any rapier fighters that you know, myself, Baron Lloyd, uh, any others that are members of the Order of the Pearl, reach out to us. Show us what you are doing because I'm. You get any more south where I live and you're in another kingdom. So I do not see most of the extreme normal fighter, northern fighters on a consistent basis, except at a mirror or uh, Jim Joust or whatever. And 
so there's not a lot, whole lot of north south travel below between the Virginia North Carolina border. But if you're doing videos, if you're writing papers, if you're um, holding classes, send it and let us know. Um, a lot of people use the term ignorant in a very negative manner, whereas I see it as an honest term. I'm ignorant of what you are doing if I don't see you or see you doing it or see you participating or you speak to it, to me about it. So reach out to us. Uh, it's on Facebook. I am Jim Looper, uh, L-O-O-P-E-R. I'll type that in the comments here in a second and you can search me up. Uh, currently, I think my profile picture has a bowler in the hat because there are a few of them across the nation. But reach out to me that way and you know, let me see what you're doing. And it can be discussed. And we do share links on the order pages. We share links to people's works. So if you have a wiki or a YouTube channel or you know a, a Google Docs shareable page, send it to us so we can share that and the other members of orders can go look at what you're doing. That's really good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so that's I would definitely underline that that reaching out to the people who have been on that path is still, even though they a lot of times they disagree on their standards, it's still better, it's still way better than than uh than than not knowing uh so it's almost done with it's uh 10 58 right now um i'm going to send out an email to the uh to the um participants on the university page uh where uh, i'm going to include some links i'm going to include some uh some of the portfolios i've talked about so like remy's remy's youtube channel uh guy windsor's uh um wiki and uh and uh um let's see baron lloyd's page just some good examples along with the deck for this class and some useful links uh, so that if you want to take this further uh, and uh, and feel free to share it far and wide you know i'm i'm all about open source so uh, i'm gonna send that out and thank you so much for attending this class and uh, enjoy the rest of your university today thank you i'm also going to jump on lloyd's class right now thank you